This video looks at the symmetry properties of the Riemann tensor and uses those properties to determine the number of independent components it possesses in a given n-dimensional space. It does this by looking at the possible combinations of values the indices can take given the symmetry properties this tensor possesses. So the Riemann tensor has this form, generally expressed in one index up and three down, one contravariant, three covariant. And here's its form. Now we can lower the single upper index, this delta here, we can lower that using the metric. And when we do that, we end up with this expression here. All indices in the tensor lowered. All right, the indices of this tensor take values ranging from 1 to n, or in relativity 0 to n minus 1, with n being the dimension of the space concerned. Now some of these components can be shown to be zero, no matter what dimension we're in. If all the indices are the same, substitute that into the expression here, you'll find it's zero. So when the Riemann tensor has all indices the same, that component is zero. Now some components are related to others by the symmetry properties, which we've seen in our previous video. But how these were arrived at was shown in that video. Uh, but here, just uh, in the first two indices, alpha mu, uh, you can see that when those first two indices are reversed, mu alpha, we, that component becomes negative. Here, in the original uh, component here, if we reverse the order of the last two indices here, over here, gamma beta, it also makes that component negative. All right. If we now swap the first pair of indices with the second pair of indices, there's no change in the sign. So that's to begin with, and how we arrived at those have been shown in a previous video, or some justification for them. All right, from an earlier video, we also found that Riemann tensor the following cyclic symmetry property. If you hold the first index fixed, and then you can cycle through the others, just permute them. Mu, beta, gamma, gamma, mu, beta, beta, gamma, mu. You can also do the same with each of the indices, so you can take the second index and hold that constant and permute the other two and you get the same array. And this means that any one of these components can be expressed in terms of the other two. So, for instance, if just looking at this expression here, if we just take the first one, we can write as a negative of these two here, the second term, or we can just do uh, an index reversal, such as, say, the last two indices, and make that positive, and we can have a nice expression here. So, any component can be expressed as the sum of the other two when you permit, permit the indices or cycle the indices around. So there's a bit of a dependency there, um, but later on we'll see that this result will help to reduce the number of independent or distinct components by a factor of two-thirds. All right, now we can use the symmetry properties to spot those combinations that go to zero. So if we take this one, for instance, here's this first symmetry property, alpha, mu, beta, gamma. If you reverse the first two indices, it becomes negative. Now, that tells us that those components where, say, the first three indices are the same, and the last one varying, where i does not equal j, then it's not possible to reverse the first two indices. And so this object can't be the negative of itself. And so any uh, Riemann tensor that has three, the first three indices the same, and the last one different, then that will be zero. Let's have a look at the second symmetry properties. Alpha, mu, beta, gamma. If we swap, um, uh, if we swap uh, alpha and mu again, mu alpha makes negative, as we saw earlier. But now if we have components that have the first two indices the same and the last two indices the same, even though here i and j don't equal each other, they're different, they're not equal to each other, then again it's not possible to reverse the order of the first two and produce a negative result over here. This, this thing, which is identical to this thing, can't be the negative of itself. And so this component of the Riemann tensor where the first two indices are the same and the second two indices are the same, although i and j are not equal, has to be zero as well, because it can't satisfy the symmetry property. Something can't be, you know, plus five can't equal negative five, they're, they're different objects. Um, <clears throat> now if we look here, again the same thing here, let's have a look now here, let's just say we have those combinations of the Riemann tensor uh, components where the first two indices are the same and the last two are different, so, and here i is not equal to j, not equal to k, but just the first two are the same, uh, again, we sh according to the symmetry property, we should be able to reverse the first two indices, the order of them, and produce a negative result. Well, you 
you can't do that if they're the same. This object is identical to this object, it can't be its own negative, and so indices or components, sorry, of this form, where the first two indices are the same, have to go to zero. Um, now, just just have a look here now what that means if we take the uh, Riemann tensor and if we reverse the last two indices, beta and gamma are swapped here, it makes it negative. Now again, if we have a component of the form I, K, J, J, well, you can't reverse those and make it a negative because this component here is identical to this component. It can't be its own negative, so that's impossible. So components of the form I, K, where I and K are different, and then J, J, where the last two indices are the same, have to be zero as well. Now that leaves us with the following three acceptable combinations that we can have. R, I, J, I, J, where I does not equal J, and R, I, J, L, I, where I does not equal J, does not equal L. And finally, where they're all different, I, J, L, K, and none of the indices are equal to each other. Okay, next page over. Now let's begin with the first one, R, I, J, I, J, uh, where I is not equal to J. So how many ways can we choose I, and then how many ways can we choose J? Well, looking at I here, there's n number of ways we can choose that. So in two, di two dimensions, we would have two components. We'd have, say, uh, uh, a theta component, a phi component, so we have two choices of them here. But if I is not equal to J, then in the second case here, we only have n minus 1 ways of selecting the object that goes in here. Same again here, so I and J there, repeat it. But here, there's n number of ways we can choose that. And I will sum, will go from 1, to n, depending on the dimension of the space, and so in n-dimensional space there are n ways of picking it, and three-dimensional space there will be three ways of picking that, which means there will be two ways of picking this one. In four-dimensional space there will be three ways of picking that, which means there will be three ways of picking this one. Alright, now given the symmetry r i j i j equals r j i j i, the number of components is half to a half n times n minus one. So the number of ways of picking for this index and for this index is n times n minus 1. But given this symmetry here, ij, ij can be swapped j, i, j, i. And so because of that symmetry, we have, we have half the number of components because these will be the same. So the number of components, the number of independent components, will be a half times n times n minus 1. Now, in the case R, I, J, L, I, I not equal to J, not equal to L, how many ways can we choose I, then J, and finally L? Well, I can be chosen in n number of ways. J must then be an n minus 1, and L in minus 2 ways. So from the previous slide, we had a half times n times n minus 1 ways to select I and J. So that leaves n minus 2 ways to select L, giving the total number of ways to select the indices, because remember they can't be equal, as being a half times n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. Alright. Alright, how about the case where all the indices are different? They're not equal to each other at all, they're all different. So the first pair of indices i, j can be selected in a half times n times n minus 1 ways. The second pair of indices, l, k, can be selected in a half times n minus 2, n minus 3 ways. Um, remember, l, k, k, l. So halve the number because they're going to be the same. And this gives us, when we multiply these together, this will give us a half because this and this, this pair and this pair, it gives us a quarter n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 ways to select these indices. Then we have the symmetry ijlk is the same as rlkij. So we can halve this result to 1 eighth n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 ways. And we're not finished there yet. Due to the cyclic symmetry relation, this last result can be reduced by a factor of two-thirds. Remember, one of those components from the previous slide could be expressed in terms of the other two. Remember a few slides back. So this gives us two-thirds times that object we saw from the previous page, which gives us one-twelfth times all of this. Now we add these to find the total number of independent components. So these are all the situations we looked at. So there was the first one, where you had the indices i, j, i, j. And this one here, where we had i, j, k, we had three. And then here we had all four different. When we add that up, you get this 1 on 12 times n squared times n squared minus 1. This gives us a total number of independent components for the Riemann tensor 
where n is the dimension of the space in which we're interested in. Right, the number of independent components of the Riemann tensor in each dimension is shown in this table. Um, just to remind you, there's a formula again. The dimension of the space, and some numbers here, so the number of components in one dimension, I have one. Uh, in two dimension, you'll have two to the four, um, because there are four components and four indices on the Riemann tensor, and each of them can take on two values in two dimensions. So you have two to the power of four is 16. In three dimensions, you're going to have three components to the power of four, maybe one. Four dimensions, you'll have four to the power of four, 256, and so on. The number of in independent components in one dimension is zero. The number of independent components in two dimensions is one. And we've seen this in a previous video in an application of the Riemann tensor. And then in three dimensions, six components. And in four dimensions, we have 20 independent components, and so on. All right, now the Riemann tensor can be contracted to produce the Ricci tensor. The symmetry properties of this tensor can be used to tell us which two indices can be contracted. So if we have a look at R, I, I, J, K, um, you now multiply by the inverse metric um, to raise this index here. So this is the, in other words, this is just this. So this is another way of writing that. But what we can do now is that we can swap the order of indices to get a negative. So a and I are swapped over here, that produces the negative here. Now, next step, what we can do is also swap the metric. The metric is symmetric, so that doesn't change anything by swapping that around. And then when we sum out the I and the I, we end up with negative R, A, J, A, A, J, K. Uh, now, A is a dummy indice here, so we just put back I and I. But what we find out is the relationship between R, I, I, J, K, and this object here. Now, this part here without the minus sign is identical to this part here, so this thing cannot be its own negative. And so, contracting on the first two indices, notice the i and the i are the same there, which means we want to contract on the first two indices, it's not possible. So, r, i, i, j, k is zero, so we can't contract on the first two indices. This only leaves the first and uh, this only leaves the first and third or the first and fourth indices that this tensor can be contracted upon. So we can the first index and third index. Okay, let's have a look at that. We can rewrite that in this form here. So all of the indices lowered, multiplied by the inverse metric in order to raise it to produce this object here. Same thing again. Let's just swap some indices. The i and the k it becomes k i. That makes a negative there. All right. Next step there, we can sum out the a's. On the left with i, j, k, i is the negative of this object. So contracting on the first and the third indices is the negative of contracting on the fourth, on the first and the fourth indices. Look at from another direction, using the first and fourth indices, let's start here, in the beginning again, and let's multiply the inverse metric times this object here with all the indices lowered. So this is just another way of writing that. When we do that, let's swap some indices. We're going to swap the whole pair, ki and aj, swap them over so there's no change in the sign. Then the next step, we're going to swap the k and the i to be give ik, that puts a negative out front. And then uh, we can reverse the indices, the order of the indices on the inverse metric here, because of the symmetry of that. Uh, when we do that, sum out the i's, and we're left with negative r a k a j. All right. So, um, same thing here now, let's just swap some indices here, so this AJ and AK will be swapped, just the order of those two, that doesn't change the sign in doing that, and when we do that we find that if we contract on the first and the fourth indices, it's the same as the negative of contracting on the first and the third indices. These two results tell us, gives us a relationship between the two, so that means we can, so might as well choose, generally choose the first and the a third you'll notice in relativity contracting on those two indices, um, but if you take the negative of that you could contract on the first and the fourth. In two dimensions there's only one independent component, because remember uh, in two dimensions you only have, uh, for each index you've got a choice of one or two, your first coordinate, your second coordinate. Um, the indices can't all be the same because they'll be negative, uh, otherwise you'll have zero. Um, you can't have the first two indices the same, or the second two indices the same. 
Um, so all the choice of the left and two dimensions is one independent component. And using the symmetry rel relations, it can be rearranged to write in different orders. Some of them are negative, but there's only one independent component. Now this component can be contracted to find the curvature scalar for the given two-dimensional space you might be in, and the way to do that is this. Now it's contract on the first and third, then multiply by the inverse metric, summed over mu and beta, and that will give you the Ricci scalar, the curvature scalar, which we saw in the application of the Riemann tensor in a previous video. And that is that.